Welcome to Severe Heights. If it's your first time with us online, we're so glad that you dropped by. And if you're here to watch a past message, you're in the right place. If you have questions about giving, next steps, or you just wanna learn more about who we are, click the link in the description or just visit us at severeheights.org. Thanks so much for being here. Let's jump into Sunday's message. A few weeks ago, actually two weeks ago, we started the message with a series of questions and the questions were something like this. Should you be living where you're currently living? Should you be doing at your current job what you're currently doing? And we asked this question. The third one, on behalf of anyone that was single, dating, ready? Should you be dating the person that you're currently dating? These are big questions that cause us to get a little nervous, right? To get fidgety. Uh, The big question behind all of that was, are you exactly where God would have you be? Meaning, are you doing the things that God would want you to do right now? Well, this week, I want to pick up where we left off a couple weeks ago. And for this month, I plan to do a series of messages about this topic of knowing what God would want us to do. And today, I want to pick up where we left off uh, with an illustration. I'm sure there is a percentage of people in this room that will resonate with this. By the way, to the middle school students that are in the room right now, you're not. But, but stay tuned because this actually happened. Uh, there's a large percentage of people in this room that grew up watching this. Anybody remember this? Um, To the middle school students that uh, are not aware of this, this is before there was cable TV, before there was like satellite TV, before there was internet TV. We had a TV that had, let's ask the adults, how many channels? Three. Three three channels. Uh, Minds are blown right now from the younger students, right? And of those three channels, they were often quite fuzzy. Uh, you would be sent, if you were younger, some of the adults in the room were younger then, they would do it themselves. You would be sent, I'd be sent by my parents to go to the front if the TV was fuzzy and to adjust, as a friend pointed out a minute ago, this little knob around the channel changer. There was no remote, it was us. And we would adjust the knob until it got a little bit more clear, but it usually didn't work. Over time, they introduced this thing and this would go to the top of the TVs. Yeah, I hear all this, ah. And what that would do is that would try to make that signal a little bit better. And um, eventually what would happen is the parent would say, okay, raise this one a little bit higher, this one higher, to the left, to the right. And then you'd stand there like, perfect, you've got it. And you'd have to stand there for the signal to be right. Um, I decided to purchase one of these this week. I am happy to give this away after this message, all right? Um, It smells awful and it's... uh, It's about, uh, I think I paid $30 for this thing. But I want you to imagine, when you think of the TV and this, um, this has a lot in common with us trying to figure out what God wants us to do in life, like this image. If you can imagine, um, you've got this, and we're trying to find the signal that's out there somewhere. We're just not 100% sure how to find it. And we're making these adjustments in hopes that, we can see what God would want us to do clearly. Um, I wanna ask a question that everybody in the room can get involved with right now, and that is this, I need a show of hands. Have you ever had a difficult time discovering God's will? Would you raise your hand? Now, keep them up because I need everyone to look around, especially the young people. You think it's new and unique to you, it's not. Um, This really kind of first hit most of our radar Uh, We discussed this this past week as uh, friends. Most of us, it hit our radar kind of our junior and senior year of high school, maybe the junior and senior year of college. There were a few on staff that it really resonated during their middle school time frame. But ultimately, like God's will and what he would have us to do, it starts to really show heavy junior, senior year of something. And we ask these questions like, where are you going to school? Like, is it going to be a a local school, a community college? Are you moving off? What do you want to be? Because that's affiliated with the school. What do you plan to do? You know, what will your major be? And all of a sudden, when you start asking these questions, I know there's some juniors and seniors in this service, most of them were in the last one, but, but anxiety starts to climb. You start to, to fidget. You get nervous. I, I want you to know, this is kind of where it, it first shows its head. It starts to grow as you get older. You start Wondering more things about what God wants you to do. Like, should I date them? And should I marry them? Then you're wondering, should we have kids yet? Um, should my kids play in this league? Should they go to this school or should we get them in another? 
should I make decisions for my kids? Because for every parent in this room, there comes a time where you're wanting your kids to make a decision, but, but sometimes we see pretty clear what the decision ought to be. Or how about this, as parents, like, like, should I take this job? Or how about this? Since I've done this field of work for so long, should I go out on my own? Should I sell this business? There are adults at this church, every service that, have, that are dealing with that question right now. Should I sell this or should we keep going? Um, should I sell the house? Should we buy a house? Should we build a house? Pressing even more, like more specific, more often. Should we buy a new car? Do we actually need a new car? Like what does God want me to do? I need to know and I need to know with clarity. Um, understand that many in this room, like, like I said earlier, the questions make us nervous because you've got a big decision that you, have to, you're, you have to make and it's close and you don't want to get it wrong. Or some of you are really intrigued because you've made a series of significant decisions in the last few weeks or the last year, and you're hoping they were right. This room's surrounded by people that have made bad decisions in the past, and perhaps we're intrigued on what God's will should be on behalf of decisions because we don't want to repeat any more of those bad decisions anymore. And here's what I know about God's will. There's a sense in which it can be so mysterious. And there is a weight that's affiliated with getting to know it and getting to know it right. Like we want to know it. We want to understand it. We want to comprehend it. We want to hear what God wants us to do. And I'll be the first to tell you, I have never heard God's audible voice. I don't know if I want to hear it. It would scare me. Like, like I genuinely feel like, like I don't know if I want to hear it. But God speaks clearly through his word. God speaks clearly through circumstances, through wise counsel. But still on the flip side, there is a little bit of a mysterious nature to what God wants us to do. And unfortunately, far too many of us, sometimes we overanalyze it. And sometimes we go to stupid places to help us make decisions. Like perhaps some of you are like in love with someone or you think you're in love. You're like, should we take it further? I'm not sure. And you're out to dinner with a group of friends and you're like, God, I just don't have a clue. And randomly you open one of these and you get this advice, right? <laughs> now you're not serious on it, but you're like, maybe this is helping. Um, perhaps some of you will remember this when it came to making decisions. Anybody remember shaking one of these, right? Yeah, everybody's in tune. That is a genius way of making decisions, isn't it, right? I remember growing up um, in elementary school and we had that piece of paper that you would fold and make all this stuff together, you know, and um, each little tab, there was an answer. Like that, that's really wise as well, okay? I remember one of my student camp experiences I was in the middle of making a big decision and uh, some guys were a little bit older. Um, I think I was like a freshman and they were juniors and seniors. They said, let's go out the bat, well, let's talk about it. And we were talking about the decision. And I remember one of the guys said, hey, I've got an idea. And we're sitting outside, just about four or five of us. And they said, let's do this. And they opened the Bible, random page and went and read a verse. And I'm like, that, that is not the wisest way to do it either. I can assure you. Like you're gonna come across some verse and it just doesn't make a bit of sense. And unfortunately there is a weight affiliated with it. And we do some stupid things to find it. By the way, I will tell you, it's not always common sense stuff either. Like common sense might tell you to do something that God's telling you to do the exact opposite. Let me give you a defining moment in my life. I had some friends that uh, we're a part of this church. We went to youth ministry together. We were on mission trips. We went on camps, close friends. We went to college together. I remember when we were first registering for classes, a group of the friends had jobs lined up if they would get this degree and go through this program. And then afterwards, there were jobs that were set for them. And there was a job set for me if I would do the same thing that they did. It was already communicated. There was some inside pull from family members. And I remember they were all picking this class. They were all doing the same thing. And we're in this room together registering for classes. And I'll never forget because God had been wrestling with me the last couple years about me going into ministry. And it was vague and I didn't know what was next. But, but I knew what those guys were doing wasn't what God called me to do. But there was the pressure because it was common sense. You could get a job. And I remember they told me, just take the same class we're doing. We'll, we'll all work together. I remember for the first time in my life, I went against common sense. And with all the pressure in the world as they were watching over my shoulder, I hit a different key to go a completely different direction so that I can move in the direction that God was calling me into ministry. So understand, like, like on behalf of God's will, it's not always just common sense either. Common sense would do what they're doing, get that job. But God was calling me somewhere different. 
Now, the question that we all wonder is this, how do we know what God wants us to do? I mean, we try all different types of things and we think, but do we really know? Well, today I wanna help us know. I wanna help give us a framework on how you discover this, something that God brought to my attention years and years ago and periodically I like to share it, but especially today on behalf of the students. But before we get there, uh, I wanna kind of give you some principles that'll lead to the framework on making decisions. Here's some principles about what God wants you to do. Number one, God's will on what he wants you to do. It can be known. He wants it to be known. Understand like today, strategically, before the service, before the message part, in the worship, we selected songs that reminded you about our good father. And what good father doesn't want his kids to know what he wants them to do? What good father doesn't want his children to listen to what he has to say? In other words, understand God's will can be known because we have a good father. It's why David prayed it this way. Psalm 143 verse 10, teach me to do your will for you're my God. Why would David pray to God asking him to teach him with clarity to do his will if God's will can't be known. David would go on to say, may your gracious spirit lead me on a firm footing because God's will was the foundation. It was ground level. It was firm for making wise decisions. Uh, why else would the apostle Paul pray this on behalf of God's will for a local church? Colossians 1 verse 9. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why would Paul pray for a church to discover God's will if it can't be found, if it can't be known, if it can't be discovered? Or how about the way Jesus taught us to pray? He said, when you pray, pray this way, our Father in heaven, how will be your name? And then he gets to verse number 10, may your kingdom come soon and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, God's got this will that can be known, what he wants to accomplish on earth through you and in you. So in the first place, understand that, that God's will can be known. He's a good father. Number two, I want you to understand this, that God's will cannot just be known, it can also be trusted. Now, some of you will not say this out loud, but you will question this one. In fact, some of you are afraid to discover God's will in a decision because you think it's not gonna be an enjoyable thing for you to do. Matter of fact, you think when it comes to God telling you to do something, the end result is gonna be misery. Like sad Christians are sad because they're following God's will. You're afraid that following God's will is gonna make you kind of like this, this uh, monk or a nun that never gets to talk to anyone, never smiles. Uh, it's like God is this cosmic killjoy and he's sending you off to mission field and you will not enjoy life. Understand that couldn't be further from the truth. Let me ask you a series of questions, ready? Who do you think created pleasure? Who created happiness? And what about the source of joy? The source of laughter? It's a father who wants us to understand that his will can be trusted because his will is good. Paul would say it this way, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. And look here, here's what it's like. It's good, it's pleasing, and it's perfect. So the real question is, will you trust it? His will can be known and his will can be trusted because it's good, it's pleasing, it's perfect. Otherwise, there's a tendency if we don't trust his will to do our own thing. And truth be told, it can be fun to do our own thing. But it typically gets complicated and messy. There's something about doing God's will and there is a flow affiliated with it that's difficult to describe. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it's good, it's pleasing. And it's perfect. It can be trusted. So much so that Paul even takes it a level deeper. He says it this way. Now all glory to God who's able to do through his mighty power at work within us. He will accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or might think. So God's will can be known. God's will can be trusted because it's good, it's pleasing, it's perfect. Here's number three. This is where it gets complicated, but I need you to pay attention because it makes all the sense in the world. God's will has a few dimensions. 
Meaning if you were to go to the end of the Bible to find a concordance, a concordance just lists all the different words that show up in different verses. So if you were to look up God's will, you would see all these different verses where it shows up and you were to go to those spots. I remember doing this distinctly when I was younger. You'd look up God's will. There are three categories for God's will. And I would write down three different columns and I would look at all the verses and I would put the verses in the appropriate column. This will give you a grasp on how you understand what God wants you to do in decisions. You've got to understand the three dimensions to his will. Number one, here's the first one, God's sovereign will. Meaning these are the things that God's going to do no matter what. Meaning it's his will to happen and it will happen. Meaning nobody can stop it. Nobody can pray against it. You don't even have to pray for his sovereign will to happen. It's going to happen. No one can do anything about it. For you and I as followers of Jesus, we have got to become super familiar with God's sovereign will. One of my heroes that shaped me a lot in ministry, his name's Don Wilson. Don's on staff with us. Don taught me about God's sovereignty when I was growing up. This was Don's definition of the sovereignty of God. God sits on his throne and he does as he pleases. So there's no stopping his sovereign will. He's going to do it no matter what. Here's some examples, like Galatians chapter four, verse four. Look at it. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. It was gonna happen no matter what. People people could pray against it. People could fight against it. People could wish it wouldn't happen, wait it would happen till later. Didn't matter. When the right time came, it was God's sovereign will. He was going to send his son and she was go- he was going to be born from a virgin named Mary. It was his plan. It was his sovereign will. There was nothing anyone could do to stop it. You didn't even have to pray for it. Here's another example of his sovereign will. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Look, I am coming soon and I'm bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. Once again, it's gonna happen no matter what. You don't have to pray for it. God, please judge me. Please evaluate me. Please do. You don't have to pray for it. It's going to happen. It's part of it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Now, why is all of this important for us to understand concerning his sovereign will? You ready? Because God uses people to accomplish his sovereign will. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at some of those people. Remember, we spent time specifically looking at Abraham when he was called to go to a place that he didn't even know. Notice how God used Moses and David and Nehemiah and Mary. Understand, God uses people to accomplish the things that he's already gonna do no matter what. So if you don't know what God's already up to, you might miss how he wants to use you in the process. So that's God's sovereign will. The things he's going to do no matter what. And you read through scripture, you discover it, you identify it, you recognize it. And sometimes, not all the time, sometimes you understand God's sovereign will. So that's category number one. Category number two is God's moral will. These are the principles that God gives to guide us. Simply put, when you read the Bible, this is right, this is wrong. These are the laws. Do this, don't do that. And guess what? Once again, you don't have to pray about this. You can read it. You got to follow it. These are the laws and principles that basically say, okay, lying is a sin. Don't do it. Stealing is a sin. Don't do it. Gossip is a sin. Don't do it. And so some of you, let's say how it might play out on this one. Like you're dating someone and you think you want to get married. And so you're like, man, maybe we should move in together, live together to see how this is gonna work out, to see if we ought to get married. After all, like you wouldn't buy a pair of shoes without trying them on first. So so, so maybe we should pray about that. No, there's a verse for that. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse three, God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. Sexual sin, it's a catch all term in the text. All sexual sin outside the realm of biblical New Testament marriage. Understand like you don't have to pray about it. He's already made it clear. No. That stuff should wait till after marriage. But you don't understand, Tim. Trust me, you don't have to pray about it. You don't have to argue with it. It's crystal clear. Here's another example, 1 Peter 2.13. For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority. Let me show you what this looks like. Uh, It happened a few months ago. Anybody remember tax time? When it came time for taxes, you didn't have to pray about cutting corners. You didn't have to pray about 
Should I be honest or should I be deceitful here? No, understand it is the Lord's sake that we should submit to all human authority. Which means, how about this? Frustrating, isn't it? So consider this morning on our way to church, some of us went 10, 15, 20 miles an hour, higher than that because it's our cool highway. It should be faster than that right here, right? And the irony that we were doing that to get to church, <laughs> to find a spot, to get a seat so we could hear about God's will, right? While we were breaking God's will. Now, concerning God's will, think about this. God's will never contradicts his word, not once. So when you see a sovereign will, you watch it, it's in his word. When you see his moral will, it's right there in his word. It's very clear, black and white. It's got this small font. You just read it verbatim. So we have his sovereign will. That's this side. We got his moral will. That's this side. Now here's the one that everybody wants to know. The third category is God's personal will. Meaning the decision God wants you to make for your life. And these decisions are always tied to the direction like for the rest of this day, for the rest of this week, next month, next semester, next year. This is where all those questions that we mentioned at the beginning, should I date him? Should I go here? Should I buy this? This is where all those questions come into play. And understand, um, this is where faith comes in. And this is where there's a beauty of this framework that I want to address because if you'll notice when it comes to making decisions, it's not like God's going to say it out loud. Like uh, it wouldn't be faith if he pulled off the roof and said, you know, let me tell you what to do, right? Instead, there is this thing for each person in this room where God has a personal will for you. You also see this in scripture with different people. Like the apostle Paul, he would pray periodically. Um, he would make statements, well, God's will has been for me to stay in this city a little bit longer. Or two weeks ago, we talked about Paul meeting with the people at Ephesus. He'd spent three years with them and everything was going great. And he told them, hey, um, God's called me to go somewhere else. It was God's personal will for him to go somewhere different. How about this? Paul would say it. First Corinthians 1, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Like that was part of God's personal will for Paul. He's like, Paul, I'm calling you. It's part of my will for you to be a apostle for my sake. And here's another one. How about 1 Peter 4, 19? This one's uncomfortable. So then those who suffer according to God's will, wow, should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. That's difficult to read. I mean, it's God's personal will for some people to suffer. I know it gets complicated. Did he arrange it? Did he allow it? Well, all we know is it didn't happen apart from his permission. And sometimes it's part of God's personal will for people to suffer. And we know people like that. Uh, here's one of our favorite sets of verses on God's personal will for us. It's written by the wisest man that walked the planet earth. His name is Solomon. He's got two verses that are usually back to back. I want to read the second first verse, Proverbs 3, verse 6. He says this, seek his will in everything you do. So when it comes to his will, think about those three categories. The sovereign, the moral, the personal. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you the path to take, the guy to date, where to move. Do you buy this? Do you stay? Do you retire? But it goes back to seeking his will in all you do. Now, this is a beautiful promise on behalf of God's will. Like, like seek his will, meaning his sovereign will his moral will and his personal will. Seek that and he will make everything clear. Let me kind of give you an analogy for this, all right? Um, I want you to imagine there's a cruise ship that's leaving New York City and it's headed to England, okay? And you're on the ship. When you get on that ship and it's leaving New York and it's headed to England, the destination from New York to England, imagine that's God's sovereign will. Like you're on the ship, there's nothing you can do to stop it. It's going there, period. It's going there. And you're along on the ride. That's God's sovereign will. Ready? His moral will is how the people that are on the ship get along in the journey. Like how they behave and interact with the ship's rules. Then you've got his personal will. 
That's each person on the ship's individual role, their responsibilities as they're on the journey. So that should give you kind of an idea of those three categories. His sovereign will, it's headed there no matter what. His moral will, this is how you behave and get along. And the personal will, that's your unique role on the journey. So let me ask you a question. Which one of those are you most interested in? The sovereign, the moral, or the personal? I would say the vast majority of people in the room are most concerned with God's personal will. So let me say something that gives clarity on behalf of every decision you're gonna make. This is why I spent so much time explaining those three wills, ready? God's personal will is always sandwiched between his sovereign will and his moral will, always. Here's what I mean. The more familiar you and I get with his sovereign will, what he's gonna do no matter what, And the more obedient we are to his moral will, the things he's told us to do, the things he's told us not to do, as long as we submit and obey, the easier it is for us to discover God's personal will for us. It's right in the middle. I want to try to explain it this way as a parent, um, because we've all had... Uh, been in the situation maybe with when we were kids with our parents but as a parent sometimes you know you want to help your kids we've got two kids Elon and Silas periodically you want to help give them some advice because we've got a little bit more wisdom because we're older like we've just got that all it means is more experience we've seen bad decisions and how they play out time and time again this is periodically you'd love to speak into them but time and time again periodically the kids don't want to hear it right we did the same thing to our parents you roll your eyes you walk away ready Do you know when they do this? Like roll their eyes, walk away. Do you know when we did this to our parents? Ready? Here's the answer. When they've already made up their mind on what they want to do. And it's contrary to the very thing that God might want us to do. I'm going to ask you a question. Don't you think we do the same thing with God? Like we're thinking, I just want to know what he wants me to do. I'm really not worried about the sovereign will, the things he's going to do no matter what. And I'm not really that concerned about his moral will. Like I want to do good, but there's a couple areas that I'm just okay struggling with. I'm going to tell you, if you're struggling with this and you're not willing to obey it, no wonder you're struggling here. So then let me tell you what we do in the fallout. We decide, okay, go with your gut. Somebody says, oh, trust your heart. That's the stupidest advice anyone can give you. Listen to what Jeremiah says. Look here, Jeremiah 17, 9. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Jesus would go on and explain it this way. Mark 7, for from within, like out of a person's heart, that's your heart and my heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within the heart. That's what defiles you. So trust your heart. Not at all. That's why um, when you think about it, we gotta be careful because with big decisions, everybody's got them. You ever notice with any big decision, it is never an emotionally neutral setting because all big decisions are emotionally high, which means our hearts are engaged. That's why we can't trust our heart always. That's why he's telling you, seek his will in all you do. That's why he tells you like, surrender the heart to his sovereign will, his moral will, his personal will, like in all aspects. Let me show you how this plays out 25 years ago. 25 years ago, probably next month, Jenny and I had been dating almost seven years and we didn't know whether or not God wanted us to get married. And we were wrestling with it hard. I wanted to be a pastor. She wanted to be a doctor. She had been accepted to med school in Memphis. And there was a hero that I looked up to. His name was Adrian Rogers. He was a pastor in Memphis, Tennessee. And periodically, like once a year, I'd get to spend some time, a day with Dr. Rogers and pick his brain and ask questions about all kinds of stuff. And 25 years ago on this time, Jenny and I went together and we sat down with Dr. Rogers and we explained our story. We're like, man, we don't know what to do. She wants to be a doctor. She's accepted to med school. I, I want to be a pastor. We just can't figure out how does this pastor and doctor and how does it work? And 
how about the kids scenario? And how do you do all of this? And God, we've been praying to God, asking God for clarity. And Dr. Rogers, we just don't know what to do. Can you help us? Give us some wisdom. And he said, all right, both of you, I want you to read these two verses together. He had Jen read one, me read one. He t- turned us to uh, Romans 12, one and two. I'm gonna read it to you. Like you're there with us, all right? So I read out loud, Jen read out loud. Here's one of them. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because he's all, all of it he, that he's done for you. So he's like, Tim, Jen, have you given your, God, your, your body to God? And let them, your body, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he finds acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Then one of us read the next verse. He said, go ahead, verse two. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And then he pressed in. He's like, hey, all right, let me ask you questions. Both of you, you've given your life to Jesus, right? Yes. Both of you love each other. Yes. Both of you, is there anything in your life right now that's, a sin that you've embraced and you just don't care what God thinks, you're just doing it anyway. No, periodically we mess up, but we confess it, we're clean. And he said, look, it sounds to me like both of you are presenting your bodies and your minds to God as this beautiful sacrifice of worship. And he said, based on Romans 12, verse two, because of this, you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing and perfect. And he said this, let me help you make the decision. Ready? He said, as long as you're in the center of God's will, like you're familiar with his sovereign will, you're obedient to his moral will. When it comes to his personal will, he said this, you're not gonna make the wrong decision as long as you stay there. And all of a sudden it was like, ah, such relief. Like we were overanalyzing this to death. And would you know it six months later, engaged and married and God has done beautiful things through guidance from someone else about finding his will. I remember wandering throughout life with each step of the way. Difficult decision after difficult decision. Ready? Why does God seem to make it so difficult to figure out what he wants me to do? Then it dawned on me. God's more interested in me discovering him than me discovering his will. Because when I want to know what he wants me to do, guess what I do? I get super close to him. And when I'm super close to him, it's causing me to become familiar with the sovereign will. I read his word. Causes me to get more obedient to the moral will, like the things I should do, things I shouldn't do. And all of a sudden, part of the natural flow is a byproduct of discovering his will. Apart from that, I make some pretty bad decisions. We all have. The room's full of broken people making bad decisions outside the realm of God's will. If you're one of those, can I encourage you with something today? Is this, it's a discovery. Broken people have an easier time discovering God's will. You know why? Because it's easier for us to pray, God, I want your will to happen because mine sure hasn't been working. So on behalf of God's will, I want us to look at these two verses one more time. Proverbs 3, verse 6. Seek his will in all you do. And he'll show you which path to take. Now let's go to the first verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. Here's a beautiful prayer that we can pray based on everything that we've looked at today. Ready? God, I trust your will is good. It's pleasing and perfect. I read it. So will you make it clear for me? Should I register for this school? Should I date this guy? Should we buy that, buy that car? Should I take the job? Should I stay? Got to trust it's good, pleasing and perfect, but will you make it clear? Help me to know which one to do. And then let's add the most important part of this prayer. Ready? And whatever it is, I'll do it. Meaning as you make it clear, it's not for my consideration. Like, okay, that's just one more option. Nope. It's for cooperation. You make it clear, I'll walk in that direction. Father, today in this room, we have all kinds of people that are making significant decisions. Some have made bad decisions. Remind them they're not alone today. 
Thank you for time in your word today that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that your will can be known and your will can be trusted. You're not a cosmic killjoy. It's good, it's pleasing, it's perfect. And thank you for shedding light on those three dimensions of your will, your sovereign will, what you're gonna do no matter what. The moral will, these are the things you've made crystal clear in black and white font inside the Bible to do this, to don't do that. And in that thing that has us curious, your personal will. Help us to understand today that your personal will is always sandwiched right between the sovereign will and the moral will. Meaning the more familiar we become with your sovereign will, what you're going to do no matter what, that's why we come to church. That's why we open the Bible. That's why we study. That's why we sing. And the more obedient we are to your moral will, the things you tell us to do, that's why we come to church. That's why we read in the texts the things to do, the things that we shouldn't do. The more familiar, the more obedient, the easier it is for us to see those big things for us. And God, I pray that as we see with clarity the big things that you've called us to do, we would continue to walk in obedience. And I pray all this today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm asking in the Father's name Reveal your heart to me
prayer I'm asking in the Father 